um, yeah, and thank you very much, Steve, for the intro. And I would just want to start off by saying thanks to everyone who's been involved in organising this series of webinars. Um, there's been some absolutely fascinating webinars. I've learned a huge amount and, um, and, and been very inspired by a lot of the talks of what I've seen. Um, so I really hope that, that my talk will, will make a useful contribution to this series and, and hopefully educate some of you about an issue which, which I believe has somewhat flown under the conservation radar, if, if you would excuse the pun. So I just want to start really by introducing the organisation that I work for, the World Parrot Trust. Um, we're an organisation focused on the conservation of parrots, but many people ask uh, why parrots? So I want to give a bit of background to, to parrots as a, as a group of birds. So there's around 400 or so species of parrots recognised around the world. They're distributed throughout tr the tropics and, and Southern Hemisphere in particular. Um, this is a a heat map showing the diversity of species um, around the world. So that the warmer the color, the, the greater the diversity of species. And one of the things that's quite striking about this is that, that Africa is actually quite depauperate in terms of the number of parrot species that, that are found on the continent. Um, we don't really understand the reasons for this, um, but maybe that's something we can discuss a bit later as well. Um, but what it sort of, I guess, lacks in diversity of species, it certainly makes up for in terms of, sort of diversity of, of different sort of, um, uh, sort of ecological niches and, and biological aspects. So you've got a range of species uh, from things like the peach-faced lovebirds, which you find in the, you know, the very arid ecosystems of Southern Africa, um, ranging to species like the yellow-fronted parrot, which is found in uh, high altitude forests in, in Ethiopia. Um, and then some species that are extremely poorly known. Um, and a very good example of this is the, the Nim Nim parrot, which is found, um, well, we, as far as we know, in uh, parts of Central African Republic, um, in Southern Chad and Sudan. Um, it was only actually first photographed in the wild a few years ago. Um, very, very poorly known species. So the African parrots have a lot of, hold a lot of mysteries. Um, so parrots, uh, by some measures, are more threatened than any other comparable group of birds. So this uh, figure here uh, shows the red, li red list index, uh, which is a, a sort of aggregate score of, of the threat status of a group of species. Um, so the lower the red list index, now let me just get my pointer working just a moment. Let's see if I can get that working. Oh. I seem to have lost the menu for the pointer, unfortunately. Uh, but really? hopefully you can, you can really? see my pointer, okay. Um, yeah, so the lower the, the, the red list index, the, the worse the conservation status. And as you can see from this, you know, generally the conservation status of birds has been declining, uh, but, but parrots really drop off the bottom compared to other comparable groups of birds. Um, although you notice this is actually quite out of date now. Uh, so we really need to update this and, and see what the situation is currently. So there's a project for someone. If there's anyone sat at home with nothing to do, uh, that'd be a great, great bit of work. Um, so why are parrots so threatened? Uh, well, a few different aspects of their ecology and behavior may make them particularly predisposed. Um, so many species are large bodied and have a very slow life history. So they're very slow to reproduce um, and therefore um, unable to say, respond to threats. Um, many species are ecologically specialized. So a lot of parrots are what we call secondary cavity nesters. So they rely on cavities pre-existing in trees um, and so often they require big old trees, uh, which are often the, the trees that are disappearing very quickly. Um, so this photo on the left, this is the hyacinth macaw, which is the largest parrot in the world. Uh, this is uh, Lillian's lovebirds or Nyasa lovebird, which is another species we, we do a lot of work on as an organization, um, which research shows is very closely tied to, to Mopani woodlands. Many species are island endemics. 
Um, so in the African context and some of the islands in the Indian Ocean, uh, there are several endemic species. This is the echo parakeet from the island of Mauritius, which at one time was down to just a handful of individuals in the wild, but there's been some fantastic uh, conservation efforts that have um, really brought that species back from the brink. And then uh, sort of a particular relevance to what we're talking about today is that many parrot species are exploited at very high levels. They're trapped in the wild, um, by and large, for the pet trade. And um, yeah, all of this together has put you know, around a third of the species of parrots at some risk of extinction. So the World Parrot Trust was set up to uh, address some of these threats. Uh, the organization has been around since 1980, so we're just entering it's our fourth decade now. Uh, we're actually technically headquartered in the UK, but the organization has long since sort of expanded beyond that, um, beyond the UK. Um, and we work with partners and collaborators around the world on a variety of different projects, um, some of which I will be talking about today. So the, the mission of the World Parrot Trust uh, or the missions uh, is really a dual mission. One is uh, helping parrots survive in the wild. So there's a conservation mission, uh, but there's also, um, and also to help parrots flourish in companion care. Um, so there's a welfare mission as well. And uh, trade issues, the trapping of wild birds for the pet trade cuts across uh, both of those issues, which is one of the reasons why it's very much a focus of ours as an organization. Now, Bird trade has a, a long and, and complex history. I mean, people have been keeping birds, um, well, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, um, were all well documented to have kept uh, parrots and other birds as pets. Um, there are records of uh, international trade or at least regional trade um, dating back many years. This is a, uh, some rock art, a pteroglyph from, uh, from Southwest USA. Um, of a macaw, which was not thought to have occurred there, and um, evidence suggests that this is an indication of, of long distance trade routes that existed you know, well over a thousand years ago of macaws coming from South America. Um, and then this uh, painting on the left here uh, from the 1400s from a Dutch painting uh, featuring um, a parrot, again showing uh, international trade. Uh, in parrots um, for uh, as uh, companion birds, but of course they're very people have very diverse motivations for for keeping birds, um, particularly with parrots. Um, people seek companionship. Um, parrots form very strong uh, social bonds, um, and they do that with with people as well as you know, with their partners in the wild, um, and so they can be great great companions for people. Um, People keep birds for their, their singing prowess. This is a photo from uh, a singing competition in Thailand. Um, people race birds. Um, birds are important attractions um, for their aesthetic beauty. Um, and there's also uh, birds are kept as sort of prestige items. So um, particularly, uh, well, it was very popular um, in Europe, uh, several hundred years ago to when you had your your portrait taken uh to have a, a parrot in that picture with you and parrots were seen very much as i um, mean this was a time when explorers were going out and bringing back all sorts of exotic animals from around the world and uh, having a parrot uh, showed you were well connected so um, you could afford such things um but prestige still motivates people to keep rare and difficult to to obtain parrots today but there are lots of harms associated with the trade. Um, I think we covered briefly biodiversity loss. Um, the trade can drive species to extinction and has done. Um, I, I put a picture of a European goldfinch up here. So this is a, a very common species to, to people in Europe, um, but very uh, heavily trapped and traded and kept in North Africa. And populations of European goldfinches have declined by around 56% or their distribution has declined by 56% uh, in North Africa in the last couple of decades. They pretty much disappeared from Algeria and Tunisia uh, as a result of this. And of course, lost, losing species from a community can have knock-on effects for the, the ecosystem function and the services that that provides. There are harms linked to the, the spread of infectious diseases. Um, we're all acutely aware of, of the risks posed to that at the moment. Um, 
but the, the trade in birds has spread diseases such as uh, beak and feather disease virus, which also has consequences for the conservation of endangered species. Um, and this is actually a photo of an echo parakeet with beak and feather disease. Um, which is thought to have spread to the island of Mauritius uh, through importing, importation of other parrots that then it escaped into the wild. And diseases such as avian influenza um, can have huge economic benefit, uh, huge economic costs. Um, if, if, um, if there's an outbreak of avian influenza, um, you, then huge numbers of uh, poultry and other livestock have to, be, have to be killed. There's also risks posed from the spread of invasive species. So there are many uh, parrots and other birds have established populations outside of their native range as a result of this trade. That can have implications for the native communities, um, very much change in, in avian communities in different parts of the world. Um, for those of you in South Africa, um, you'll probably be aware that the several species, in particular ring-neck parakeets, are doing very well now in certain areas, um, in Kartang and, and in KZN. Um, and of course, there are animal welfare issues, and some of these are obviously pretty acute. Um, but arguably, there's no there's no humane way of trapping birds in the wild for for a life in captivity. Although some some methods are worse than others. So something that I think a lot of people are perhaps not that aware of is Africa is a leading source of wild birds for the global market. So this is data taken from CITES, that's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. This is sort of official data uh, aggregated by them, reported by all the countries that are um, signatories to CITES. And over the, the last four decades, um, in which CITES has been operational, there's been over 3.3 million parrots have been reported in in legal trade, and I put legal in inverted commas there. Um, this is trade that's taking place uh, with export permits uh, that have been issued, but there aren't. There are often compliance issues associated with the issuing of those permits, uh, which I will talk about a little bit more later. But over the last decade, African parrots have been three of the top four most traded wild bird species listed on the appendices of CITES. Just as a bit of a primer for CITES, um, for, for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, it's the, the International Convention on the Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And it was set up basically to ensure that international trade in wild animals and plants doesn't threaten the survival of the species in the wild. Now, there are lots of policy processes and mechanisms that, that operate under CITES to try and achieve this, this goal. Uh, one of them is the placing of different species on different appendices. And you have Appendix 1, which essentially prohibits uh, international trade in wild specimens for commercial purposes. You have Appendix 2, which for a species where trade is permitted uh, under quotas and under a permitting regime. And then there's also Appendix 3, which countries can request species to be put on that if they are requesting cooperation from other parties to, to monitor and regulate trade. Uh, but it's important to note that most wildlife isn't actually listed on the appendices of CITES and isn't actually dealt with um, by the processes under CITES. And then that includes most birds and indeed a lot of African birds. So just to give a bit more of an indication of what, what we're sort of talking about, really, these are, these are photos um, of African parrots in trade. Um, we've got uh, red-faced lovebirds. These are Timne parrots. Senegal parrots, uh, rose ring parakeets, and these are, were until recently uh, considered conspecific with the Cape parrot in South Africa, um, but these have now been split off. Uh, this is a photo taken in West Africa of, of parrots in trade. And these photos are actually all taken uh, from trade advertised on the internet, which I'll talk about a little bit more later as well. And I've got a short video here, uh, which I hope will work. Um, but I hope, I hope that we've got a good enough bandwidth at home, but sort of gives an impression of, of what the trade looks like. So this is a video taken inside an exporter's facility. These are ring neck parakeets. Um, we've got various dove species. Um, lots of species housed together in very cramped conditions. Obviously that's uh, poses a lot of risks as far as disease transfer. 
um, between species um, and also sort of creating a, a stressful situation. In various species of songbirds, canaries, waxbills, um, uh, widers, bishop birds, often lots of weavers, and things like that. Um, But it's, it's really a huge diversity of species that are involved. Um, so although most of my talk is about parrots, um, a, a lot of it, I think, is very relevant to a lot of other species. Um, so here we've got marabou stork, black crown cranes, uh, some palmnut vultures, uh, and hornbills, um, all species that are uh, disturbingly common in the trade. And, mostly species that are not actually uh, listed on any of the CITES appendices, so there are no requirements under, under the convention to, to regulate the trade. So individual countries may choose to regulate the trade, um, but actually there's no uh, requirement to monitor what's taking place. It's determining that uh, export quotas or numbers being exported are not having an impact on populations in the world. So this graph here shows exports of a number of African bird species that were listed on one of the CITES appendices, CITES appendix three, um, up until 2006. And as you can see, very large numbers being exported each year, up to 1.6 million um, in the year 2000. And then what happened in the year 2006 is, well, two things. One, the EU banned the importation of wild caught birds, uh, which was a very um, important move. Um, the EU was a major destination, was the primary destination for a lot of birds from Africa. Um, and so overnight, that pretty much removed one of the major markets for these birds. Um, and that was brought, uh, that ban on the importation of wild caught birds was brought in initially in response to concerns about an avian influenza outbreak at the time. Um, and I think it's absolutely crazy that, that many countries are still importing very large numbers of wild caught birds from countries that, that are dealing with outbreaks of high pathogenicity, uh, avian influenza, even now, um, with everything we are sort of know and the level of awareness about the, the risks of infectious diseases. Um, but at the same time as that ban happened, many species were delisted. And so as and when and the requirement to report, to collect data on numbers being exported disappeared. And so we don't have really a good handle on what's happened since then. Um, so you know, a crude look at the data suggests, well, maybe the problem has been largely fixed. Um, but actually, um, we have very little data on the situation which is again, something else I'll return to. Um, so at the World Power Just, we have what we sort of grandly call our multifaceted strategy for, for addressing trade. Um, so at the center of everything really is research, you know, understanding what's going on, the scale and scope of trade, trade routes, uh, where important populations are and everything, and that, that research really underpins everything else that, that we do. Um, which ranges from a number of different tools effectively, uh, from site protection, um, protecting important populations um, that have been identified, advocacy for stronger legislation, um, and also with corporations for actions, uh, particularly in the air transport sector and the tech, tech sector. Um, enforcement is obviously critical. There's no point in having uh, very strong rules and, and regulations if, if it's not enforced. Um, and so we do a lot of work to, to actually investigate the nature of trade and get that information to in law, law enforcement people so they can act on it. And very much linked to, to that is the work that we do to support parrots that are seized from trade. Um, one thing that, that we found over the years is that by effectively supporting birds that are confiscated from illegal trade, you remove the burden and one of the, the impediments to enforcement. Um, and so often by simply putting in place capacity to, to manage bird seeds from trade, uh, it can actually lead to, to more law enforcement. Demand reduction is obviously a very important tool as well. Um, it's really important to uh, understand the, the nature of demand, why 
people are purchasing these birds um, and the extent to which that's sort of an opportunistic decision that's that's driven by the availability of these birds versus a, a more deep-seated demand where people are going to, to go to, I guess, various lengths, including you know, committing uh, well, committing crimes essentially to, to purchase these birds. Um, and then what's absolutely fundamental um, to everything we do is about capacity building and trying to mentor and support um, essentially tomorrow's conservation leaders, the people who are going to go on um, and expand and continue this work. So most of the rest of my talk is about African grey parrots. It's a species that we've worked on a lot and, um, and is, I think it illustrates very well um, the nature of the challenges, the nature of the problem, and I think acts as a very good sort of flagship for, um, for bird trade issues in many respects. So in 2012, um, African grey parrots were split into two species. So there's the Timne parrot, which is found in West Africa, um, from Guinea-Bissau to the western parts of Ivory Coast. And then the grey parrot, which is found from uh, Eastern Ivory Coast, right the way through um, the forests of Central Africa uh, and stretching even into Kenya. And this is a species that was once very widespread and very abundant throughout these forests. Um, and certainly early accounts uh, indicate that there were, there were vast numbers of these parrots, enormous roosts, uh, totally several thousand parrots coming to, to overnight roosts. So a highly social species, um, they're very conspicuous, um, they're very vocal when they're moving around, they move around in big flocks, they aggregate together in large groups to roost, um, to feed, they, they nest in, in aggregations as well, um, and in clearings in the forest in Central Africa, and I think this would be something be very familiar to Rod, um, they come down to clearings in the, in the forest as well. Um, but this makes them very vulnerable to traffic. Uh, it means they can be relatively easily trapped in large numbers, which makes it very efficient and a very profitable activity. They also have a slow life history, so they don't breed um, for the first few years. Um, and yeah, only produce one or two chicks per year. And there's been very well rapid population declines, and this has been pretty well documented more recently. So although it was long suspected, and there are lots of anecdotal reports about um, you know, big collapses in populations, um, it's only really been well documented uh, in the last few years. And there's now a number of studies indicating very rapid population declines. Um, and I think one particularly important uh, study by, by Nathaniel Anorba uh, in Ghana um, took advantage of where there was some baseline data of um, densities of, of African grey parrots uh, in the early 1990s, which was collected actually as a, in response to concerns about the, the, the sort of perceived declines in populations at that time. So there were already big concerns that populations were rapidly declining. Uh, but since then, um, you know, they were able to go back and basically repeat those surveys, and since then, uh, populations have continued to decline by between 90 and 99 percent over, over the last two generations. Um, so African grey parrots were in 2012 considered as, as least concern. Um, it was thought that there were still huge numbers of African grey parrots um, and then they were uplisted to vulnerable and then in 2016 to endangered on the basis of these rapid declines. Here's another short little video, which is taken from a, a film put together Across by the, range, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Parents, and transport them um, to major cities for export. Each line here indicates a commercial shipment for international buyers and suppliers. Data collected over the past 40 years reveals a vast system of trade reaching all over the world. So I, I don't know if you could hear that well, but um, sorry, moving ahead. But basically, each of the lines uh, in this indicate a, a shipment of parrots that's taken place over the last forty years, and I think this just 
illustrates simply the, the scale of the trade that's happened, uh, how much, how many birds were being trapped and exported around the world during that period. So obviously we, we became very concerned about the, the situation. Um, but another thing that was also an important part of the, the story really was the lack of compliance with the CITES measures that existed. Um, so it wasn't that the trade was completely unregulated. There were various measures put in place to try and limit the extent of the trade and ensure that it was happening in some kind of sustainable way. Um, but, but the reality was there was no baseline data being collected on the impact of, of wild populations until relatively recently. But there's also a lot of compliance issues. So this was something that, that we put together. Um, looking, for example, this is between the period of 2007 and 2014, uh, there are over 43,000 parrots exported in excess of the, the published quotas um, that have been put in place to try and ensure trade was happening at sustainable levels. There's 14,000 parrots exported from countries describing them as captive bred, uh, but from countries where there's no captive breeding facilities, uh, or at least no sort of commercial scale captive breeding facilities that would be able to produce those kind of numbers. Um, and even parrots being exported from countries where they had, had no populations. Mali in particular was exporting large numbers, but it's not a, not a range state for African grey parrots. Um, so I think it became very clear that what was needed was stronger international protection. Um, we did our best to document that and get that information in front of decision makers so that they could make an informed decision about how best to manage this trade. Um, and in 2016, at uh, the Conference of Parties, which was held in Johannesburg, uh, a number of uh, range states for African grey parrots got together um, and put forward a proposal to, to actually transfer African grey parrots to Appendix 1 and basically put an end to the legal trade um, in wild, parrot, wild African grey parrots for commercial purposes. Um, and this was broadly supported by, by other CITES parties and, and went through. So I'm now going to talk a bit about some of the work to, to identify and protect uh, key sites for, for African grey parrots and particularly timnay parrots. Timnay parrots we are particularly concerned about because they have a very restricted distribution um, and occur in a, a, a parts of Africa that have undergone very rapid rates of deforestation as well. Um, so starting from a very low bar to, to a much worse bar and then with trade impacting on top of that. Uh, so this is a I'm going to talk briefly about a project uh, that we were involved with together with EBAP, the Institute for Biodiversity and Protected Areas in Guinea-Bissau um, and various other partners and this was funded by the IUCN Save Our Species by and large. We basically set out to conduct surveys of the Pujagos Islands um, to determine the status of the species throughout the islands. And the Pujagos Islands are the only place in Guinea-Bissau where Timnay parrots were found. Um, just to come back, I mean, these are the Pujagos Islands here. It's an absolutely fantastic archipelago of islands. Um, it's a very special place in, in many respects uh, from the perspective of wildlife. There's some incredibly important turtle nesting beaches. Um, and and some and also from a cultural perspective, um, it's an absolutely fascinating fascinating area. Um, and we were able to, to publish what was the first published national survey for for Timnay parrots in, in any country. I think what what was particularly remarkable was that prior to to this study being commenced. There weren't any published studies on, on Timnay parrots, and we couldn't even find any photos of Timnay parrots in the wild, which is remarkable to think that these are species that are very um, familiar to people in, in captivity. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Timnay parrots around the world, yet we know almost nothing about their lives in the wild. Um, the results of those surveys suggested that there was certainly less than a thousand parrots remaining, um, probably a lot less than that. Um, and there were two islands that were really important, uh, these two islands, uh, the Javi area and Mayo in, in the south, which somewhat isolated from, from the other islands and have no permanent human settlements. Um, 
so have been to some extent naturally protected from high levels of trapping, but there was uh, quite a lot of trapping taking place. And so something that the National Parks Authority then did was to employ former parrot trappers to help monitor and protect nest sites. Um, and that was great because it generated some data on the breeding biology of this species, which is something we, we didn't know anything about. Um, but it was also put a, pretty much an end to the trapping of Finlay parrots um, in those islands, um, which is obviously fantastic news. And yeah, it's often difficult to know how effective these, these kind of projects can, are, are um, to have sort of assurance that, that there isn't necessarily any trapping going on. Um, but there are some, some interesting, sort of, I guess, good reasons to be hopeful in this situation. Um, so there was um, early on uh, a, a poaching event happened. Uh, so one of the nests, it was observed, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see, but a nest cavity being hacked into with a machete in order to access the chicks out of it. That was noticed. The people monitoring the nests then went and made some inquiries. Um, amongst various people they knew and the overnight the a chick was returned in a cardboard box uh, at the National Park headquarters. And they then followed a couple of quite uh, frantic days of trying to figure out what to do with this chick. Um, there was no one from the World Power Trust on the island at the time and there was very little phone reception. Um, there wasn't basically wasn't any you could occasionally get a message through every few hours if you hung a phone in the right tree in the right place and the wind was blowing in the right direction. Uh, but the decision was made to uh, try and put the chick back in the nest. And remarkably, even after a couple of days, the parents came back, uh, they picked up feeding the chick, uh, they were able to monitor that nest with a camera and that chick did eventually fledge. So a great sort of positive outcome and very reassuring story to support those efforts. We've been approaching um, a, a similar project in, in Sierra Leone in a similar way. Um, in this case, collaborating with the National Protected Areas Authority and researchers from the University of Freetown, as well as other partners. And again, conducting surveys uh, throughout the coastal region of, of Sierra Leone um, to understand the status of populations and where there are important populations. And again, the nature of, of trapping um, and trade and understand it's sort of in detail the socioeconomic dimensions of that trade. Um, understand who's involved, what their motivations are and, and how to sort of move forwards with developing uh, initiatives to try and protect those populations. Uh, we've been able to document new breeding areas. Um, these are some photos of, of courtship of Timnay parrots, um, which I think are probably the only photos of, of um, courtship behaviours of, of too many parrots. And then building on from that work, um, and this is some work that's, that's ongoing right now, these are photos I received uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, a series of community meetings to discuss uh, what can be done to, to help protect too many parrots in particularly important places, um, putting in place billboards to help communicate pro conservation messages, um, and radio programs and then what's been very encouraging has been the integration of a number of actions to help protect Timlay parrots and their nests uh, into a co-management plan for the Sherbro River estuary which is a very important area for Timlay parrots um, and involves 10 local chiefdoms all collaborating together on a, on a coordinated uh, management plan. slightly different set of activities in Nigeria, um, in this case working with Ifani Izenwa at the University of Nigeria in Suga. Um, Ifani has been surveying throughout the, the sort of forested areas in southern parts of, of Nigeria um, to understand the sort of scale of threat of, of trapping um, and particularly the, the um, extent to which uh, nests are, are being poached and juveniles are being taken and where adults are being trapped um, and been able to build a map of the a distribution of different threats throughout Nigeria and again identify where the most important populations are uh, but he's also been looking at the domestic trade in 
in African grey parrots as well. Um, so uh, African grey parrots and other parrots uh, are actually quite popular as pets. Uh, it's very common to see them being sold at the roadside and in markets. Um, and it's also not uncommon to see uh, body parts being sold as well for, for belief-based use in traditional medicine. And then building on this information, um, we coordinated the stakeholder workshop uh, last year, which unfortunately had to be held virtually. Um, but we're now working on a number of activities around uh, raising public awareness um, together with, with Wild Aid and a local news company there. A news production company um, and we're hoping that the film will be aired this weekend um, in relation to that. Um, but at one of the uh, challenges that we identified in Nigeria was that although Nigeria actually has very strong legal protections, um, the government has actually been very outspokenly in support of addressing the trade in African grey parrots um, in international forums. There's, be very little enforcement and there's basically zero awareness amongst the general public around the threats facing the species um, and the impacts that it's having on wild populations. So changing to a, a different set of activities. Um, so the World Parrot Trust has uh, what's called the Fly Free program, which is set up to basically support uh, groups dealing with uh, confiscated groups of parrots. Um, so to provide technical, financial and logistical support, uh, very often in, in emergency situations. Um, so we'll often be approached by a group that's just seized a load of parrots and they don't know what to do. Um, try and get them advice, try and get them the funding they need, try and make sure that those parrots are going to be managed in a, in a responsible way and, and if possible can be rehabilitated and released back into the wild. Um, Quite often we, we have a number of vets that we work with um, who can um, jump on a plane and go and help out in these emergency situations and we, we've helped out in that way um, in a number of different countries um, but also to, to do actually proactive capacity building in, in different countries. So for example in Angola um, as as part of the broader project uh, targeting or aimed at addressing wildlife trade. Um, we did training at, with the national parks people um, on sort of first response and you know, what to do when you first encounter parrots. You know, those first few hours, first couple of days are absolutely critical for ensuring those parrots survive. And it's very important that people know what to do in that instance, uh, but also to help build capacity. And this was basically what basically build capacity for the rehabilitation and release so this is essentially what they had um, and how the, the parrots were being kept um, so we were able to support them in, in constructing something that was much more um, much more suitable um, and uh, give those parrots the best chance that they had and then related to this I actually traveling to Liberia on Saturday where we're going to do something quite similar there um, and deliver some training to the uh, wildlife crime unit on first response activities um, and how to how to handle parrots. Uh, this is um, some work that we've done together with the Rio Primate Rehabilitation Centre, uh, which is a, a rescue centre primarily focused on on rescuing primates. Um, in many countries, uh, the only rescue centres that exist are really focused on, on dealing with primates. Um, so in many instances, we, we support those centres in actually taking parrots and being able to, to manage them. Um, the Wiro have taken a number of groups of African grey parrots seized in the Eastern DRC, and we were thrilled last year that um, the first group was able to be released into Cahuzzi Viega National Park. And this release was attended by the provincial, the deputy provincial governor, um, the manager of the national park. Um, and there was you know, widespread local support for that. Um, and this was the first time ever there had been a, a soft release of African grey parrots in the DRC. So there has been huge numbers of confiscations, 
uh, over the years, um, probably numbering thousands of, of parrots. Um, if they've been released at all, um, they haven't been released uh, in a sort of supported way, uh, on undergone sort of appropriate rehabilitation and then supported as they've been released back into the wild by being provided with food, being allowed to leave the, the aviary in their own time. But the other important thing about these releases is that they can be great opportunities for uh, starting conversations with uh, people in power, decision makers, and getting them involved in, in parrot conservation and uh, thinking about these issues. Um, so they're, they're great opportunities for, for raising awareness. Uh, this is a release that took place in Uganda, uh, where Jane Goodall attended the release to be able to and open, open the cage to allow the parrots to leave the aviary. Um, there were four news crews there from, from Uganda. Um, it made the national news um, and was, was a great positive conservation story. Um, I think did a lot to raise, raise awareness. Now you may be wondering whether or not these parrots survive um, and how effective these releases actually are. Um, it's actually very difficult in a lot of situations to be able to monitor parrots post-release. Uh, it's not easy to, to put satellite tracking devices on them um, that will tell us a huge amount about how long they've survived for. Um, but all the parrots that are released have, have rings put on them that, that can um, be used to identify them. And so some of the, the more eagle-eyed among you might have noticed on that first slide that this parrot had a ring. Um, this was a photo taken in Uganda, um, I think nine years after a group of parrots were released. And of the hundred or so parrots that were released, at least seven of them are still being sighted. Um, what we're now 10 years uh, later. Um, and these birds have gone on to pair up with wild birds. Uh, they've been shown to be breeding. So it definitely shows that parrots, these parrots can be rehabilitated in return to the wild, even if they've been through pretty traumatic ordeals, um, they, they can be returned. Okay, and finally, I just want to talk about um, sort of a different set of activities that we've been involved with uh, focused on online trade. Um, so online trade is very much an emerging frontier um, in the wildlife trade. Um, I don't think it's, it's um, overstating it that the internet has really supercharged the wildlife trade. Um, the internet creates a number of challenges. Uh, it says driven demand. Um, I think the, the penetration of YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and things have sort of opened up the, uh, I guess, wonders of parrots uh, to people. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, done a lot to encourage, normalize the keeping of parrots um, in driving demand. It also provides ways to connect buyers and sellers um, so particularly some social media platforms are used to uh, buy uh, international traffickers effectively to, to connect with potential purchases in different countries. Um, and they discuss and exchange knowledge about how to evade uh, rules and regulations as well. This is just one, one advert uh, of, a, of a shipment of, well, of African grey parrots in a holding facility uh, being advertised for, for exports in India and Bangladesh and Nepal. But there are also opportunities that come along with the on, online environment. Uh, it provides opportunities to monitor what's taking place. Um, so insights into trade that we might not be able to get any other way. Um, and also opportunities to, to educate people and maybe uh, change people's behavior. So some work that we've recently been doing with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime has been to try and develop an automated system for detecting illegal parrot sales on websites. Um, and this um, highlighted something that we weren't really aware of in its scale and scope, but is actually the, the trade in African grey parrots taking place online and platforms in Africa, and particularly uh, in more economically developed developed and connected countries like Nigeria and Kenya. 
that information um, is, is very useful for then taking to, to technology platforms um, and to legislators to try and encourage changes um, that will help address this problem. Um, so the BBC, uh, the BBC program called BBC Click focused on technology, uh, which recently profiled the role of the internet in the trade of African grey parrots. And I'd encourage you to, to go and watch this video on YouTube. It's a short eight minute film about the, the trade in African grey parrots online. Um, and some very interesting undercover investigations looking into various aspects of how that trade operates. And what's been great about that is it has led to conversations with technology companies uh, which have led to enhanced moderation. Um, so um, new mechanisms to detect and remove adverts for the ad illegally advertising um, parrots and other wildlife and new wildlife trade policies. Um, so that's been, well, mixed success. It's been hugely successful with some platforms, uh, very unsuccessful with other platforms, but we, we continue to, to try. And then similarly, um, monitoring trade that's taking place online provides opportunities to gain insights into other aspects of the trade. Um, so one thing we were able to do, um, this is work together with World Animal Protection, is actually document which airlines are being used. And there was a lot of information available online that actually allowed us to identify which airlines were involved, uh, put that together with other information and intelligence and field investigations, uh, and then take that to uh, some of the companies involved. And uh, Turkish Airlines was an airline that was um, very much uh, being exploited by traffickers to export uh, African grey parrots and other wildlife. Um, as a result of us being able to take this information to them and present it to them in a, in a sort of digestible way, uh, they put a ban on, in place a ban on transport of parrots, uh, initiated new training of their staff and also put in new additional capacity at airports. And then I guess to, to move back from African grey parrots and to, to think about the bigger picture, um, if you remember this graph from the beginning, there's this question about well, what, what's happened to the trade in all these other birds um, since 2006, since CITES was no longer requiring countries to actually report, uh, monitor and issue permits for the trade in these species. And some work that we've been recently doing with the University of Oxford and the University of Exeter has been to um, analyze online trading activity uh, to actually gain some insights into the nature of this trade. Um, so we followed 11 uh, bird exporters operating out of West Africa over the last four years, um, analyzed over 400 posts um, advertising birds for sale, um, very much targeting international markets, uh, identified over 83 species involved in that trade. Um, in some instances in, in very large numbers and very large quantities. Uh, but it's possible to also do things like look at uh, post engagement. So this is a map of where people had engaged with the posts from those West African traders. The light green circles is, is all engagement, so engagement of any kind. And the, the dark green is particularly trade related engagement. So that's um, asking about prices, asking about shipping to particular countries. Uh, basically anything that was expressing an interest in potentially um, purchasing those birds. And this flag that um, Southern Asia as, as a particularly important region, uh, at least for uh, in, uh, in the sense of this, this engagement. Um, and that's actually led us on to do a lot more investigations in that part of the world into the trade. Um, and some of that's actually discussed in that, that BBC Click program as well. Um, so it provides some very useful insights into where sources of demand are, as well as which species are involved, and, and where the opportunities are to try and disrupt those trade routes. So just to wrap up, really, I think a few, a few sort of key take home messages, um, which I'd, I'd like to leave you with. I think vast numbers of birds are exported from Africa each year. And although I've talked a lot about parrots, it's really not just parrots. Um, there are hornbills, terracos, 
uh, all sorts of raptors, uh, cranes, storks, and of course, huge numbers of songbirds that are involved. And much of that trade is, is legal or loosely regulated, if, if regulated at all. And there's really no monitoring. Um, there's really no monitoring of, of the trade or the impact of this on wild populations. So there's very little monitoring of those species taking place on the ground, um, particularly in the places where that trapping is taking place. So we have no idea really on the impact that this is having on wild populations. Um, but I think you know, with the species that we do have a good handle on, and I think African grey parrots now, we know quite a lot about what, what's been going on, the nature of the trade, how it operates and the impact it's had on wild populations. And the outcome of that is pretty disturbing. Um, so I think it's, it's, yeah, we definitely need a lot more monitoring uh, and this issue needs a lot more attention and not just thinking about the harms to wild populations in terms of um, overexploitation, but, but the other harms associated with it. We know very little about the risks posed for the spread of infectious diseases, for example. Um, we do know that some of these countries that are exporting large numbers of birds are, are dealing with outbreaks of, of um, pathogens like avian influenza. Um, so I think an important thing, a message as well, is that interactions between trade and different species are quite complex. So a lot of the, what we found uh, through a lot of our work, particularly that, that last case I talked about, is a lot of the people who are exporting large numbers of, of um, wild birds legally they're also taking the opportunity to, to then export other species that illegally. Um, so I think the legal trade provides a lot of cover and other opportunities um, for, for trade in species, illegal trade. So although the trade in some of those species might actually be potentially quite sustainable and not necessarily too problematic, uh, there are certainly risks that it then poses to other species. So we've got to think very, very carefully about that. And, and how to approach that in a sort of holistic way, rather than a sort of species by species way, which is how a lot of this work is currently done. And finally, yeah, a call for, for action really by, by governments, NGOs and corporations um, to, to work together. Um, there's, there's a lot more needed to be done to fill these knowledge gaps and to take action on it. So uh, on that note, really, just to wrap up, I mean, this work is obviously a, a huge collaboration of a lot of different organizations, individuals and collaborators. Um, and this is exactly the sort of work that we need to be doing to, to address these problems. So thanks to, to everyone for listening and thanks to everyone we've been working with and everyone who's funded this work as well. And I'll, uh, I'll finish there. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. A fascinating talk. Um, somewhat disturbing information when we uh, always when we talk about the illegal trade in um, whatever whatever animal we are talking about. But um, thank you for also putting stories of hope in there that and and possible solutions. So we now approach the um, part of the evening where we open the floor for questions. Um, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the tools at the bottom of the screen where you can um, uh, draw, your, draw our attention to the fact that you want to ask a question or you can also physically put your hand up. Um, and yeah, we would like to, to welcome everybody to um, ask their questions. I see there are some comments in coming from the chat at the moment. Um, great presentation from Andy Klee. Thank you very much, Rowan. A very interesting and educational talk. Um, I see there is a question from Fiona. What has happened to the Parrot Breeders Association in South Africa, which was implicated in illegal trade of African greys prior to COP17? I'm not sure. Um, Rowan, if you are, if you would like to answer that question, or um, if you have information on that, um, I can have a go. I mean, um, so one of the consequences of African grey parrots being put on Appendix One of CITES was that 
uh, any captive breeding facility that wanted to export parrots would need to register with CITES and um, there would be additional oversight of the, the trade that was taking place from those captive breeding facilities. Um, South Africa prior to the Appendix 1 listing was actually the major importer of wild African greys from, from range states. Um, and a lot of those parrots were coming to, to supply breeding facilities, some, some very large breeding facilities, um, basically farming African grey parrots for the export market. Um, since then, um, a very large number of facilities have become registered. Uh, over 200 of them have, have registered now with CITES and are, are producing African grey parrots for export. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the the requirements of uh, registering with CITES as well is that those facilities contribute directly to conservation of the species in range states. Um, and that's something that we, we very much sort of welcome more collaboration and discussion on to try and move that forward in a, in a useful way. Thanks, Rowan. Um, Marty, you're welcome to go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Uh, thanks very much, Ryan, for the, the uh, very interesting, as uh, uh, but also a very um, upsetting um, situation that we find um, the parrot populations in. Um, the you, you mentioned commercial breeding, um, and are those commercial breeding farms in Europe or in South Africa or in African countries? And would you say that having them actually reduces the demand? Or does it almost increase the demand because people can now get get the parrots almost easier um, than than the effort of, of of catching them in the wild? I'm just trying to uh, understand. I mean, are, is that the solution? Having lots of well controlled commercial breeding um, farms um, that that are well managed and monitored, or I mean, what 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 do, what do you think is the the best solution? Uh, it's it's a a very tricky one to answer. Um, I think it's sort of easy to assume that if you're producing lots of, of parrots in captivity, that that's going to somehow offset the demand for wild birds. Um, but that certainly wasn't the case that we were seeing um, you know, prior to the Appendix One listing. Um, you know, there was there was no clear reduction in in exports of, of wild birds as exports of, of captive bred ones increased. I think, as you pointed out, it's it's complex because the well, it's complex in many ways. It's complex because uh, one of the challenges is that by having a lot of African grey parrots um, being bred in captivity for export markets, it actually potentially does drive demand. Um, you know, it increases the acceptability and the the desire of people to own these species. If people are, uh, many people are owning them, other people want to own them. And of course, wild African grey parrots uh, are going to be cheaper um, but than captive bred parrots. Um, captive breeding is quite challenging to do in a closed system because African grey parrots take several years to reach maturity. So they'll need to be kept for several years before they can start reproducing themselves. Um, so it's much more efficient for a breeder to import wild caught stock. Um, as, as breeding stock and then be exporting the captive bred ones, which are worth more money anyway. And I think one of the things we're seeing is that a lot of facilities are now, or places are setting up in other countries um, to produce African grey parrots. Um, and I think that's where the, the ongoing trade in African grey parrots, a lot of that is going to, to, um, to supply uh, breeding facilities in other countries. Um, I mean, I should point out that um, although there's, I guess, quite a lot of uh, doom and gloom in that talk, that the situation has massively improved since the Appendix 1 listing of African grey parrots. So we recently did a study looking at online trade, uh, which showed that the certainly the sort of publicly uh, visible online trade in wild African grey parrots has declined by 96%. Um, there's monitoring of um, shipments on internal airports and on internal trade routes in some countries that showed a, a massive reduction um, in shipments of, of African grey parrots. Um, so definitely things are headed in the right direction, but there is still a concerning amount of, of trade of wild African greys. Um, I just want to pick up on one, one other point. 
is that one of the challenges that exists is that because you have this sort of uh, legal trade in captive bred parrots that's taking place, that provides a cover for the mm. for shipments of, of wild caught African greys. Um, so there's a, you know, a, a huge complexity of, of permitting requirements um, that uh, it makes it very difficult for enforcement agencies to sort of distinguish between um, shipments of captive bred and wild birds and exactly where they're coming from. And if there are permits, your permits can be misused for captive bred parrots from South Africa to then import um, wild source African grey parrots from the DRC to Bangladesh, for example. Um, so we have a lot of concerns about that. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not at all a simple case that, that it's good or bad, really. I think a, you know, a very well-regulated system um, would be the best way of doing things, but whether or not that level of regulation can be achieved in a practical sense um, really isn't clear at the moment. If that answers the question. <laughs> I could talk for a long time about that. <laughs> Thank you, Rowan. That was a very comprehensive answer. But it's also good to, to hear that uh, when the proper systems are in place, that there are positive changes happening. So that's, think, that's fantastic. Yeah, and just to sort of, I think there are there are reasons to be optimistic as well. I mean, I think African grey parrots can't be easily, like large groups of of African grey parrots can't be easily concealed. Um, and they're also not easy to mistake for other species as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have to be, and they have to be moved on planes. Um, and so it's a very different situation to say you're dealing with, with the pangolin, trade in pangolin scales or something like that, which, which can be stockpiled, uh, they can be easily concealed, um, they can be moved on boats, you know, um, you know huge number of sort of enforcement challenges whereas actually the the trade in sort of commercial quantities of wild african grey parrots have to move through a few pinch points where it should actually be relatively easy to do the enforcement so um yeah it, it should be a relatively tractable wildlife trade problem uh it doesn't mean it's easy but it's maybe easier than others yes indeed um a question from sandra um She's asking, do you have a kind of release manual for other rescue centers? And yeah. Um, not really, um, not a manual as such, but uh, we, we do have a lot of materials and resources and, and advice that we can give to rescue centers. Um, basically, I mean, what we find is that almost every situation has uh, sort of comes up has sort of unique circumstances and and logistical and technical constraints um, and so often it's easiest to sort of tailor advice towards specific situations um, based on what resources are available there um, what capacity exists in terms of veterinary skills and things like that um, but I mean there are some very good manuals that have been put together of sort of best practice in rehabilitation and and uh, release of, of parrots and those are great great resources to start from but um, it's often sort of important to sort of drill down and sort of interpret those in the context of what what the local situation is and what's actually actually feasible would you say um rowan that there are adequate rescue centers um available at the moment to to handle the problem in in some countries Yes, um, but in other countries, I mean, there, there's very little, if you know, really no no capacity for dealing with. Um, I mean, we're currently, um, yeah, dealing with a few situations in countries where there is is no capacity at all for for taking parrots, so they've gone to uh, wildlife exporters facilities to be looked after while a plan is made for them, um, which is we, we feel far from ideal situation. Um, but there are some very good rescue centers doing some amazing work and do have you know, really good capacity. Um, but one of the big challenges is often they're not quite in the right place where the seizures take place. So um, there was a couple of recent seizures in, uh, in Lodja in the central area of DRC in Sankuru province. 
um, getting those parrots to Luiro, which is basically the only rescue center for African gray parrots uh, in the DRC, involved a three day journey by motorbike and then a flight and then a boat journey um, to get them to the rescue center. Um, incredibly, all the parrots survived that journey, which is not necessarily wow. we, we expected. Um, but yeah, there was really no alternative other than for them to go undergo that journey to get to the rescue center. Um, that indicates a lot of dedication um, to, to get the job done, though, and um, wonderful that those seizures did take place. Um, Rowan, there's a question from Obit Katumba. Any known trade using eggs, is it something to consider currently? Um, the trade, trade in eggs. Is that the, sorry. So the, so the question is, is the trade in eggs a problem? Is that? Yes, I, I'm, I'm interpreting the, the question yeah. like that as well, yeah. Um, not enormously, as we're aware. There are quite a lot of scam sites out there and scam individuals sort of trying advertising eggs for sale. Um, but um, yeah, we don't think there's a huge trade in eggs at the moment. Good to know. So there's a question and a comment from Sibyl. Sibyl, are you still in at the moment? Marit, can I ask you to unmute Sibyl? Maybe she can ask the question if, if you yes. don't mind, Sibyl. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Wow, thank you, Roman. So sad to hear about the fate of uh, those birds and well, I mean, I'm against keeping any wild birds as, as pets, yeah? I mean, I have a doggy and uh, these are domestic animals which have uh, bred as pets for, I mean, <laughs> probably uh, thousands of years, yeah? But of course, there's this huge demand uh, for birds as companion birds, et cetera, et cetera. And it just occurred to me, I mean, maybe it's a very stupid question, but where I'm staying now in the cent central Germany, I we have lived 50 years ago, I have come back now after 50 years living in Africa. Uh, it caught my attention that the bird population has changed quite drastically. We do have now uh, in our urban uh, plazas, uh, quite a large population of noisy parakeets, <laughs> Alexander and Collard uh, parakeets, and I researched a bit on them. And they really have become invasive here. I mean, uh, alliance at least. Uh, They've been studied whether they're invasive, but they're certainly very loud and uh, uh, very, very uh, conspicuous because they are very beautiful, greenish with a red band. I mean, they're very pretty large and uh, beautiful birds and very social. And uh, people start <clears throat> complaining about their noise and the kind of, uh, they certainly make a difference here. And I wonder whether, I mean, it's maybe, Maybe there's a stage coming up where they will be considered as invasives, which will be controlled uh, by some means of population reduction or whatever. So I just wonder, I mean, it's maybe stupid to consider that, but uh, that some demand for companion birds may be diverted to such invasive species and that uh, uh, some trade could be organized to uh, replace the, the trade in wild birds from Africa by, by those who have become invasives in other parts of the world where they don't belong to? I mean, it's maybe it's just a very silly question, but <laughs> maybe one solution. No, I, I, one of the things that's that's crazy in the context of this, I mean, so, so ring-necked parakeets, which are one of the most invasive species, and I think probably, you know, they're in cities all around Europe, um, but also many cities in Africa and in the Middle East. Um, they obviously do very well in, in all sorts of environments. Uh, but what's absolutely crazy is, I mean, they're one of the species that's being still trapped in very large numbers in West Africa for, for international trade. Um, and in fact, in that study I talked about at the end, looking at trade on social media from, from West Africa, I think they were the species that came out most frequently being traded. Um, and they're actually one of the few species of parrots which is not listed on the CITES appendices. So there is effectively no, no real regulation from an international perspective on the trade. Um, 
ter terrifying to think what might be happening to wild populations of those. Um, it might be fine, but we, we really don't know. We really don't have any information on that. Um, and of course, you know, these invasive populations can be a problem. Um, they, they are in some places agricultural pests. There's a lot of concern about their extent to which they might be outcompeting native species. There's been quite a lot of research done on it and it's, it's really not a clear cut case. I mean, I think there are, there are some situations, you know, some evidence where they've uh, using nest cavities that maybe other species don't, but the extent to which they're really having a negative effect is, is really not clear. And one thing, um, that, that seems to be the case at the moment is they're still largely confined to quite urban environments and not really getting established outside of cities. Um, so maybe they're just part of this sort of um, sort of hodgepodge of species that you get in in cities, which are often quite sort of um, yeah unusual sort of communities of birds compared to what you see in the same areas outside of those. Um, it's it's possible that parrots, uh, those wing neck parakeets, could actually be trapped for for export. That's actually something that's been proposed in South Africa, um, as I understand it. Um, so there's concern about the invasive populations of of uh, wing neck parakeets, particularly in KwaZulu Natal, and there is a requirement for, in order to have a license to breed these, I think I might, I might not quite have this right, but I think in order to have a license to breed these, uh, the Parrot Breeders Association, which is kind of the industry body that, that oversees um, agriculture, commercial agriculture in South Africa, um, is required to take steps to, to try and manage that wild population. And one thing that they proposed is to actually try and trap those parrots to, to bring them into, into commercial agriculture. Um, but I, I don't know how far they got with that. Um, I think the challenge is it's probably too costly and difficult to catch them to actually offset the, the demand for, for wild birds. And there's, there are huge numbers being bred in captivity as well of those birds. Um, so it's not clear. I mean, there's also another question of encouraging people to, to keep species that are do readily breed in captivity, um, for, you know, which are not endangered in the wild, um, and to have those as companion birds rather than the, the rarer, um, more threatened species. Um, but that's, that's a whole other set of challenges. Um, but in some countries there are, um, you know, the, the parrots that you are allowed to keep are restricted to some of those, those more, um, less threatened species that are easier to produce in captivity. So that's a long, a long answer and a lot of different, <laughs> covered a lot of different bases. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Rowan. Your answers are very comprehensive. Thanks, Abil, for the question. Um, Rowan, I've got another question in the chat at the moment. I would just like to find out, is Mpiliseni, is he still, Mpiliseni Gazu, is he from TUT? Are you still in at the moment? Can I ask you to, to ask your question um, live to Rowan? Marit, can you see if he's still in the um, in at the moment? He is, um, Johan, I asked him to unmute. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Good morning, good day. <laughs> Thank you, Rowan, for the good presentation. I have a question. I hear you talk about the harms. Are any solutions to this harm? Um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of different solutions for, for those different harms. I think obviously trying to, to restrict trade in wild birds of those species that are particularly threatened is, is really really important um i think there's you know, sort of looking towards some of the the risks about the spread of infectious diseases i think there's a lot more we need to know about a lot of diseases that might be involved and there needs to be a lot more done to ensure practices like quarantine are being followed effectively um, um, and sort of regulation. I mean, I think 
a lot of these problems could be fixed with effective regulation, but the challenge is, is figuring out how to do that in a way that is remotely cost effective. Um, um, I hope that answers your question. I mean, there's, there's a huge amount that can be done, but I think there's no sort of silver bullets and easy answers to any of those, those challenges. Well, to, to all the TUT students, uh, when um, Mpelisseni asked that question, I saw Cheryl's um, video went on. So I'm thinking that question is going to be in the exam. Watch out for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, anybody else at this stage? <clears throat> Rowan, if, if, if I may ask, um, do you have a profile of, of the traders, of the, of the illegal traders? Who are these people? Are they linked to other criminal activities? Are they, where are they hiding and where are they coming from? Um, yeah, so a lot of the... Um, so I think there's a, a, a huge overlap between traders of, of legal wildlife um, and traders of, of illegal wildlife. Um, and so often it's, yeah, so I think, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just trying to figure out how to frame the answer. Um, yeah, I think, you know, often they, they run like by and large for legitimate legitimate wildlife export businesses that, that do a lot of trade and export and often you know they they do that very publicly and openly um and then in some instances you know where there are opportunities to to move other species through illegally um that's when that happens i think i guess to flesh out the answer a little bit more um i mean it, it's not necessarily that easy to be exporting well, it's, it's uh, large quantities of these birds. You need quite a lot of expert knowledge. Um, you need to have a lot of connections um, you know, in, the, in the air transport sector. Um, and a lot of the people who are doing it have done it for a very long time. And, and in some cases, you know, inherited the businesses from their parents and, and even their grandparents. Um, but there are, in some cases, overlaps with, with trade in other um, other products as well um, that that might be illegal I mean we don't see I mean we, we talked before a little bit about um, like before before this presentation about sort of links to terrorism and we don't we haven't come across sort of any any links to sort of really organized crime and terrorist uh, organizations and things um, I hope that so, yeah, that's very interesting because that's different from, for instance, the, the trade in rhino horn where there's uh, more, um, you know, where it's almost more exclusively illegal. So um, yeah, it's, it's different. It's a different answer from what I expected. So we're learning. Yeah, and I think, I mean, maybe something to add, and I, I, this isn't always going to be the case, but I, we don't. I think the, the people who are involved in exporting parrots often involved in exporting other live animals, but maybe not other uh, wildlife products, like things like ivory or rhino horn or pangolin scales and things like that. Um, so these are maybe quite two different um, sets of activities. Um, I'm sure there is some overlap in, in some areas, but it's not necessarily the same people, the same trade routes involved at all. Very interesting. Um, any questions from the floor at the moment? Any questions from the chat? Marty, welcome back with another question. Go for it, please. Um, when they do get bust um, in the different countries, so maybe you're talking Europe, if they get bust by the CITES people, whatever the case is, um, what what is the punishment? Um, is it just a fine? Have they got enough money to pay, or do they get imprisoned? Or um, and then like if they're in, for example, the DRC in the middle of the jungle catching parrots, what is the punishment or the consequences of them being bashed? Um, is there corruption and that sort of stuff there as well? 
Yeah, I mean, that's one, one of the big challenges uh, is like, even if there, there are sort of strong laws in place, um, whether or not there's sort of capacity to actually enforce those laws, even when someone's been, been arrested, um, it's very uncommon for people to have a custodial sentence for, for trading parrots. Um, it is possible, it has happened, um, but very often people get off with, at the most with a, with a light fine um, or, or a bribe even. Um, so it's, that's something that, that needs a lot more attention um, and there are some great organisations doing a lot of work to, to sort of follow through legal cases, wildlife trade cases. Um, through the courts and to sort of provide the, the support to judiciaries to, to be able to actually secure prosecutions and um, and see the law being upheld. Well, there's obviously a lot of costs associated with doing all of that as well. So it's a, a difficult um, spiral, you know. Uh, you, you, you aren't getting in money to support all of those uh, initiatives. So, you know. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Justine, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Hi, Rowan. Really interesting talk. Thanks so much. Um, so where's really the main market? Is it global? Is it America? Is it Asia? Um, you know, obviously with, you know, rhino horn and ivory, there's a predominance for East Asia being the market, um, although <laughs> plenty comes through America um where are they going like where is the demand most uh significant that's really pushing it yeah it's a good question actually that's something i didn't i didn't really cover in my talk i realized um yeah so i mean it's interesting how this has evolved really i mean the so the us was at one time the main market for the um a lot of wild birds and parrots yeah. um and then in the early 1990s, uh, the US put in, there was the Wild Bird Conservation Act, which made it very difficult to import a lot of birds unless there was a, a strong conservation case to be made for, those, for that importation. Um, and then in, but then the EU was really the main market for a lot of these birds. Um, yeah. But in 2006, they put in place the uh, ban on the importation of wild caught birds, which um, you know, largely ended the trade there. I mean, there are still still birds that do make it in, um, but it's certainly not happening on the anything like the scale that it did. Uh, but really now the main markets are in the Middle East, um, North Africa to some extent, Southern Asia, so India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, huge markets. You know, bird keeping is, is incredibly mm. popular. Um, these are huge markets for, for wild birds. Um, and then also Southeast Asia, um, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, yeah. um, Hong Kong, they're all big importers of, of wild birds. And are there initiatives in those countries to stop it or is it just more, you know, incompetence or, inept, you know, or indifference really um, that you're seeing? Because, I mean, I would think, you know, I just through, from other people that I've talked to um, about sort of ivory and rhino horn trade, there's the Chinese are actually pretty good at stopping it if they can catch it and they do clamp down. Um, but obviously they're dealing with corruption on their side as well. But um, there is a world to, to stop it, which we don't even see in South Africa in <laughs> comparison um, from a law enforcement perspective. So do you get that at all in Asia? Um, in any of those countries in the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, it, it varies, varies country to country. Um, we've been doing a lot. Uh, there's, there's definitely interest and willingness to, to address the problems from some countries, uh, but I think there's a lot to be done to, to build capacity. And one of the challenges is the, the complexity of, of the regulations that exist around what's legal and what's not under which circumstances. Um, and that sort of comes back to the earlier point about having, you know, a, a trade, you know, some legal trade and, and some not and how easy that is to, to check. I mean, some, something we identified recently was that the um, uh, permitting authority in Bangladesh was issuing permits for all sorts of species that, that they simply shouldn't have been. And that wasn't yeah. to do with any um, 
uh, nefarious activities. I think there was just simply a, a lack of awareness about what, what regulations applied to which species and when. And when we raised those issues with them, they were very quick to, to fix them, um, which was very encouraging. Um, but because you have this, this vast legal trade in a lot of birds coming from other countries, it's, it's very difficult um, to, you know, you actually need the, the people who are at customs and issuing permits have to actually have a lot of knowledge about which species exist where and which should be coming where. I mean, something else we identified was, you know, all sorts of um, permits being issued for uh, things like turkey vultures uh, from from various African countries. Now, turkey vultures are not native to Africa; they're native to, to North America. Um, yeah. We're pretty sure they weren't turkey vultures being imported. They were you know, probably some other raptor um, that was being laundered under a permit for a turkey vulture. Um, but that requires the people who are issuing the permit to have some knowledge about you know, where this species occurs, what which yeah. species are commonly even in trade. Um, and there's a lot of information that, that we have maybe, and we, we look at that and say, that's absolutely crazy. Like, how can I issue a permit for that? Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't think it's, well, you know, there's a lot to be done to sort of build capacity. Um, yeah, I mean, do, do you guys have like a database? So it, like, let's say you went to the Bangladeshis and you said, well, if you type in this URL, it takes your database and it shows you photos of the various birds, the, you know, and, and basically where they're coming from, their trade status, their endangered status um, to make it easy, because I can understand, right? I mean, if you have a job in customs, you're not going to be an expert in anything bird related because your job's customs. So, I mean, have you tried to create, um, you know, very accessible databases worldwide and, and sort of share that across um, law enforcement and stuff like that? No, I mean, there are, there are some initiatives to develop apps and things for some of the common species that yeah. are in trade, um, particularly to help um, like border control and, and custom yeah. to identify things. I think one of the, the crazy things that currently is, is the situation is there, there is no definitive online list of all of the, the species that are recognized under the CITES conventions. So I'm not just talking about the species that are on the appendices, but the species that mm -hmm. aren't. Um, and so you, um, you could type in the name of a species that, that that an importer has put on the permit, mm. say, I, I want to import these, um, the authority might then go and type that name into the database, see that it's not a species that is protected by CITES and therefore issue the permit. And it may be a species that, that doesn't actually, isn't actually recognized by CITES. Um, you know, there are lots of different um, taxonomic sources out there. So it might be that this species has a Wikipedia entry and is, is recognized as a sort of separate species by, um yeah. by you know by agriculturists or something but it's not recognized as a separate species by cites yeah. and may actually be a subspecies of something that is protected mm. um and so there's a, there's a, a real need basically to have a comprehensive list of all of the do birds you think, um, do you think you can crowdsource that i mean there's so many bird lovers right that you could crowdsource people to develop an app that you know how like there's these apps now that identify plants and these apps identify so you could have it work both ways right you either take a photo of a bird or you enter the species name and it just comes up with you know where it's from indigenously what its status is from terms of endangered and you could just do it in multiple languages and, and have have it crowdsourced to I mean there's just so many bird lovers in the world I can't, you know there's got to be plenty of them that are tech savvy that would do it and you know you build up a massive app that you know can go worldwide because I think you know so much of it is knowledge right it's such a niche area um I mean I wouldn't know honestly what you know what where a parrot was coming from other than African grey <laughs> and the and the macaws I mean that would be my extent and I love birds but I'm just not focused on it, so I wouldn't know. So I don't know. I mean, it's just an idea to think about maybe having one of your partners be ahead then and, and crowdsource it and see if you can't, you know, make it easier for border control. Because um, I think it's just, yeah, I mean, it's such an overlooked area. Like you really, it's it's not well known at all. Yeah, so there, there is, I mean, it would be a fantastic resource and I think it would, would make a big difference. Um, 
there is a move at, at CITES to basically adopt a standard taxonomic reference for for birds, uh, which is available as a in a in a book form with pictures of every species. Um, at the moment, um, due to <laughs> the, the, the way that these processes work, that's probably not gonna be adopted until at least another three years. Um, everything got very delayed because of the COVID and meetings got canceled um, and put back and we basically missed the cycle of, of, of CITES. Um, so that is coming, but it's probably, yeah, or, the, I guess the decision that will make the production of something like that relatively straightforward to do is coming. Um, but it's, yeah, in the meantime, um, I absolutely agree. It would be great to develop something like that. It's, without wanting to get too technical, it's not as easy as you think it would be. Um, sure. With, with the current um, sort of way that different species are recognized and the taxonomies that are yeah. used. But you could also, I think there's a great bird app for the, that the South African bird life, one of the bird life companies that I can't remember, um, maybe, you know, Johan, you know, or um, one of the guys on the call here, where um, I think the, you, know, you can do sound recognition of their voices and it like has all, them, all of them stored. I mean, maybe you can just partner with them so you don't have to build from scratch, um, you know, so... Yeah, just trying to think of ideas because I mean it's frustrating to hear like how yeah. like the trade's just going on without any any solution. No, and one of the one of the challenges, even with African grey parrots, that's yeah. actually a very good example uh, because CITES doesn't doesn't actually recognise two distinct species, the, the Timnae and the African and the and the grey. Mm. They still treat them as a single species, um, and so there's a, a discrepancy there between there and the 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 treatment by uh, by the IUCN and many other authorities um, and so there's a need uh, what, <laughs> what's needed is basically a globally agreed list of birds to work yeah. from um, at the moment there's about four different lists that are out there that, that different people use um, and there are a lot of efforts underway to try and sort of harmonize all these lists mm -hmm. and, and get to that point um, the CITES is often very slow to, to adopt changes, often because you, these changes can have quite significant uh, implications in terms of countries having to update their legislation and things. And so they don't want to be chopping and changing backwards and forth. Um, with, you know, every time and someone suggests that a new species should be recognised, I mean, that, that's great for bird watchers and maybe they go out and buy a new book and that's the only implication that it might be. But when it comes to regulating trade and things, these decisions can actually have really big consequences, um, both in terms of how easy it is to regulate trade in, in those particular taxa and um, the sort of legislative burden that is put in place on, on different countries. Yeah. Thanks, Justine, for the questions. Um, yeah, um, Rowan, I would also just pick up on a, on a question that um, Sandra asked earlier regarding the, um, the manual for rescue centers. Um, that's perhaps something where we at Chase Green Africa could get involved in terms of if, if you would be willing to, um, to present, we could perhaps facilitate a uh, online uh, workshop for rescue centers um, and disseminate the information in that manner. We will be running in um, April a workshop for the canine APU um, unit of the uh, Black Mambas in uh, uh, Limpopo in South Africa, where we are going to get um, some veterinarians to talk to them as to how to take care of the um, uh, dogs. So in the same fashion, we can have some experts talk to the rescue centers um, in terms of how to take care of the parrots. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea, actually. And yeah, I, let's, let's have that conversation. Um, yeah, that would be wonderful. How that would work. Um, but I think there's, yeah, could be some, some good opportunities there. Yeah. Um, there's a question from John Atkins. John, may I ask you to unmute and you, you can ask the question live. Yeah, good evening. Um, I apologize for uh, getting the time zones mixed up. I'm in the UK and so I missed the talk. And you may well have dealt with this already. Um, 
Okay, my particular interest is in Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, and my question is, uh, is there any current evidence of particular species being targeted in Ethiopia and Eritrea? I know that bustards or various species of bustards have been targeted in the past, uh, but do you have any more up-to-date information than that? Thank you. Yeah, the short answer is is no. We don't really have any up-to-date information. Um, we we're not aware of significant numbers of, of birds being trapped in those countries for export. Um, but that's not to say that they're not being. Um, and we we have heard over the years, you know, odd reports about um, sort of illegal exports, um, particularly of yellow-fronted parrots. Um, so Poicephalus flavifrons, um, but they're not a species that you, you see regularly in agriculture. They're not widely kept, widely traded. And if there was a lot of illegal trade, I think we, we'd we see a lot more of them out there. Um, but yeah, no reason to be complacent about the potential threats um, because often it just takes one person to sort of latch onto an idea and to have the right connections to, to open up you know, an avenue for trade and situations can change quite quickly. But yeah, I mean, likewise, I'd be very interested, if you do come across any information um, from, from that region, I'd be very interested to hear it. Thanks, John. Thanks for the question. All right, Rowan, um, if there are no more questions from the floor, I would just like to say thank you very much once again. Really appreciate a very, very informative um, presentation tonight. I think we all really learned a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's a world that, that, you know, that's not often spoken about in conservation circles. Um, you have ivory and rhino horn and even abalone being spoken about much more than the, the, the illegal trade in, in live birds. So it's, it's a somewhat unthankful job that you do, but thank you for doing it. It's a very important uh, part of conservation. We will certainly be poorer if we don't have um, these birds um, in the ecological role, but also just purely decorating our skies. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for listening and for the, the great discussion um, and suggestions and ideas. <laughs>